Throughout the history of life on Earth, life has taken many unique and sometimes bizarre forms, with practically any niche you can think of being exploited by animals, with adaptations perfectly suited to their given environment. Some of the weirdest, as we've come to know, were some of the earliest forms of complex life to have evolved, around the time of the Cambrian period over 500 million years ago, and the animal covered in this particular video, being Hallucigenia, is just one of many from this time, so expect more videos focusing on such animals coming at some point down the line. The remains of these peculiar animals were originally described by Charles Walcott, the person who discovered the Burgess Shale deposit, naming it Sparsa, a new species of the polycate worm Canadia, although later studies by Simon Morris in 1977 recognised the animal as something quite distinct, and something far more unique and interesting than would have ever been thought of. Morris established a new genus being Hallucigenia, with the name referring to the type species' unusual appearance and bizarre, and all dreamlike quality, and would later also be relevant for its eccentric history of study. Now known as Hallucigenia sparsa, they were very small animals, coming in at lengths of between 0.5 to 5.5 cm in length, and given the uncertainty of its taxonomy, was tentatively placed within the phylum Lobopoidea, a catch-all taxon containing numerous odd worms with legs, although as we'll discuss, their dreamlike quality and therefore unusual appearance has made interpreting them all the more of a challenge, and the first point of discussion came about as to which end the animals actually stood. Morris reconstructed the animal as walking on its stilt-like spines, and grasping potential food items from the water column with its tentacles, as no specimen available at the time showed both of the rows of tentacles and or legs, with what was presumed to be the tail also being assumed to reach down to the sea bottom, and pick up other food items due to its potential flexibility with it then cooling up and passing the morsel onto the first tentacles, which would then be passed on to the next until they reached the head, which was then interpreted by Morris as being the dark stain at the end of the animal, since only the forward tentacles could easily reach said head according to his idea. Morris also suggested that a hollow tube found within each of the tentacles might be a mouth on their tips, although all of this understandably raised questions, the most blatant being the interpretation that the spines would have made walking quite cumbersome, according to Morris's reconstruction, and the second being that the method required a lot of physical efforts for feeding upon food sources that were likely low in nutrients, given the size of the animals and what the size of the food they could have fed on. Animals usually put as short of a distance as possible between their mouths and food source for efficiency, but in this reconstruction, the distance is at its potential maximum in the case of this reconstruction, with the third problem being that this reconstruction does not explain either the presence or function of the smaller tentacles at the base of the supposed tail which will become relevant later on. A possible alternative to the arguments against this reconstruction proposed at the time is that if the spines were indeed placed at the bottom, the spines could have been used to anchor hallucigenia amongst rocks in the path of oceanic or tidal currents, with the tentacles then drifting upwards with their pincers and or mouths, catching food particles that drifted along, then passing the food along, which while being inefficient, the lack of mobility would have resulted in a saving of energy, akin to a motile sea anemone. Morris's model was controversial, although for the time being it was the best available interpretation of the time, and stood for 14 years until 1991, when new evidence from China changed this. That year, Lars Ramskold and Hao Xiangyang discovered another hallucinogen, named Microdictyon from the Lower Cambrian Maotianshan shales, reinterpreting hallucinogenia as an onychophoran, the same phylum as modern velvet worms and or peripetus, with the key character demonstrating this affinity being the cone and cone construction of hallucinogenia claws, a feature shared with only modern onychophorans, although not everyone thought along the same lines with some thinking them to be closer to arthropods and some even believing that they may be a part of a larger animal, like how another Cambrian genus, Anomalocaris, came about, with parts of its body originally being identified as three separate animals before more remains came to light. Although, given the amount of related animals that have been discovered and their complete anatomy, the latter argument is implausible. 
This taxonomic revision is not just relevant to Eleusogenia, as since they are largely assumed to be onychophorans, this would make them a part of the Ecdysozoans, a successful group of animals that includes insects, arachnids, crustaceans, nematodes, and the lesser known groups like the velvets, and unfortunately named penis worms. Prior to this discovery, similar genes and the ability to molt were the only features that united these animals together. Although now, it looks as if the plates lined around hallucinogenia mouths, which we further discuss later, appear in some worms, and the teeth lining its foreguts also appear in some crustaceans, which can be used to further link the members of this group. These elements, including the pharyngeal teeth, also found in tardigrades, indicates that equivalent structures, given how long ago hallucinogenia existed, characterise the ancestral panarthropods and seemingly the ancestral ecdysozoan, demonstrating the deep homology of mouth parts in these animals, and further linking them all together. It shows that these oral plates are a connecting character of ecdysozoa in general, and didn't appear independently although certain subgroups did eventually lose some of these features as they diversified, with the mouths of the group being extremely variable, with velvet worms and other arthropods having simple holes with unarmed throats, although penis worms do have mouths that are surrounded by spines and throats that are covered in teeth, uncannily close to what is also found in hallucinogenia. As well as their taxonomy, the study also rearranged how the animal would have moved, as the fossils found in China, while also possessing the supposed tentacles found in Hallucinogenia, also sported plates instead of spines, which were clearly unable to be used for walking, and the tentacles were subsequently identified as the animal's legs. The reconstruction of them was inverted to support this, as the tentacles, now thought to have been pairs and which were later confirmed by further specimens, would have been used for walking, and the spine-like legs became dorsal, protective armature, with the mouth tips at the end of their legs being found to be claws. Their legs, due to them having no joints, were likely controlled by changing the pressure of fluids within them, much like how starfish and sea urchins do today. Alternatively, the large spines on their back may have acted as anchor points for large muscles, which would have then powered the legs, with there being seven pairs of spines and seven pairs of legs, also doubling as protection from potential predators. They also noted that the globular, dark head proposed by Morris was likely an artifact of decomposition and that it may have been created when said animals dies, being decay fluids that seeped out of the animal before it met its untimely demise which was later confirmed due to its different composition to the rest of the fossil. Despite this, finding out which end was definitely the head region was hard to figure out, as it might either be the supposed thin tail at one end of the animal, or at the other end where the decay fluids leaked out from. It would not be until nearly four decades after its initial description, until researchers finally understood, clearly and conclusively, which end was which, with a paper that was published in 2015, where advancements in microscope technology allowed researchers to gain a better view of the fine details of the genus. Specimens, over a hundred of which, new and already known, were examined using electron microscopes, which use beams of electrons to illuminate a specimen, although advancements in the technology meant that the species could in fact be examined without having to damage them. A few years before this, using one would have meant spraying the fossils with gold particles that can better conduct the electrons, which wouldn't have gone down particularly well. To examine the specimen in the study, therefore, were the advancements in the technology. It meant that all that needed to be done was to use a very fine amount of mist water instead, which does no damage to the specimens, while revealing details never before seen. When the animals were examined, a look at the end of one specimen directed to where the tail was originally thought to be located, revealed something never before seen, being not just a pair of three-lensed simple eyes, but also a big quote-unquote cheeky smile of teeth, grinning back at the researchers, with the mouth parts hinting at a kind of suction mechanism, with this ring of teeth around the mouth probably being involved in sucking water and food into the gut, with the entire gut being preserved in some complete specimens which support this. Their eyes had three lenses, although they likely did not have clear vision, as they lived deep underwater, where light is scarce, supported by them appearing as solid masses rather than spotted grids like how the compound ones of insects would appear. 
This new reconstruction of them shown here showcases a much different animal from what they were initially envisioned as, with them having a clearly defined head, neck, and forward body region, and defensive armature that would have protected them from attack, as well as three pairs of anterior appendages that have been interpreted as tentacles used for moving food to their mouth. The spines of hallucinogenia themselves are quite unique structures, with them being made up of one to four nested elements, with the spined surface of hallucinogenia sparsa being covered in an ornament of minute triangular scales, and they continue to be unique in the other species known in the genus. The first and most well known and common species of hallucinogenia, and the one focused on up until this point, is hallucinogenia sparsa which lived worldwide, with them being most well known from the Burgess Shale in Canada, where many complete specimens have been found. Their cuticular and the scattered papillae upon them were more densely packed around their spines than the other species in the genus, and they therefore seem to have been more defensively adapted than their relatives, which will be further explained as the next two species are analysed, each with their own different anatomy and habitat preferences. The second species, Hallucigenia hongmia, is the largest known species of the genus, reaching lengths of around 30mm, although there are cases of larger ones. Their maximum size, however, is hard to determine, as no specimen has yet been found that preserves the anterior or posterior most sections. They differ from the other Hallucigenia species in several ways, with the sclerotized spines running down their backs being curved and shorter than the spines of the previously mentioned H. sparsa, as well as having a different microstructure, while the spines of sparsa are shown to have been covered in microscopic triangular scales. The spines of Hallucigenia hongmia form a net-like pattern of microscopic circular openings, believed to be the remains of tiny sensory and secretory papillae. The claws of Hongmia also seem more adapted for climbing upon sponges and rock surfaces, based on their length and curvature, which is quite unlike the more hoof-like claws of Sparsa, which seem to be more adapted for traversing muddy substrates. This could therefore explain why Sparsa possess more defensive spines, and since this implies they lived in more open environments, it meant the risk of predation was higher than for Hongmia, and over the course of natural selection, the sturdiest and the most resilient of these animals were able to survive where others could not. The third species, Hallucigenia fortis, is a lesser known and mysterious species that, while being this way currently, has provided knowledge on the ocular structure of the genus, with them being the reason we know about their three-lensed eye structure as mentioned previously. Their spines are oriented similar to Hongmia, with the larger of the sclerites curving towards the more anteriorly, posteriorly, they are positioned on the trunk. While the microstructure of their spines is undescribed and or unknown, due to their closer phylogenetic position to Sparsa, it is assumed that the sclerites of Fortis are composed of small triangular scales, with their claw structure also being similar, indicating similar habitat preferences to Sparsa. Fortis is also notable for having a short neck and a hardened cuticle around the head, which on first examination does resemble the decay fluids observed on Sparsa, although from its composition this was actually the head region of the animal, which has led to some taxonomic implications and uncertainties. A new genus described in 2015, which was identified as being close to Hallucigenia, named Collincium, was very well preserved, and given its close relation, has proven useful in reconstructing aspects of Hallucigenia, which could be down to their larger size, reaching lengths of 85mm compared to the near maximum 30 for Hallucigenia, allowing for more detail to be preserved. They possess anatomical features unknown of in Hallucigenia in great detail, which has given implications as to how they looked, with Collincium having fine anterior appendages, which were covered in a lining of hair-like setae, which could have been used for filter feeding as well as annulations lining their bodies. Hallucigenia also likely possessed antennae, with there being two short horns preserved in some specimens that is supported by not only their presence in Collincium, but also by the brains of other Hallucigenia relatives. A fossil preserving the brain of an anomalous carid, Lyrapax unguispinus, found in 2014, was found to be very similar to extant onychophorans, with the brains of them being X-shaped, with two nerves leading to the anterior portion of the brain, directly into the greater appendages, and in velvet wombs, these nerves lead into the antennae, and due to them all being close relatives, it is likely assumed that this was also present in Hallucigenia sparsa and Hongmia. 
The interesting thing is that hallucinogenia fortis appears to lack these antennae, with them having a complete head, which could be down to sexual dimorphism, although this is unlikely, and this could mean that at least one of the species in the genus may not belong. Hallucinogenia hungmia is more than likely the most distinct, as Fortis shares quite a few similarities with Sparsa, although for the moment they are all included in the same genus for the moment, as recognising similarities is often more important than celebrating differences. But more research will need to be done to clear this up. There is also the case of Hallucinogenia potentially having sexual dimorphism, as in H. Sparsa, there are specimens that differ in many ways, with the larger of the two morphs having a more robust and rigid body region, as well as a globular head with the second being smaller, thinner and more flexible. In velvet worms, the females are typically larger and this could also hold true for Hallucigenia, but we'll just have to see as this has been the case with a lot of Hallucigenia's history. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.